So welcome everybody. This is um, our webinar on confirmation practices with Andy Brogan and Helen Sanderson. My name is Yumi Stanet from Purpose at Work and I'd like to welcome you all to this, um, to this webinar. Uh, before we begin, um, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are hosting this webinar and you are joining this webinar. Uh, pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and um, extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today. In this webinar, um, we uh, from Purpose at Work want to um, give you a few pointers before we start off. Um, first of all, um, yeah, if you can keep yourself muted, um, we will be recording this webinar. So uh, be aware of that if you are on screen or you have your video on, um, that if you have your video on, you will actually be in this recording. Um, what we'd like you to do, um, whenever you have a question, please use the chat function to um, pose your question. Uh, we will not be stopping during the presentation to take any questions, but we will have a Q&A section at the end. Um, and we hope to have heaps of questions when we actually get to that point. So keep the questions coming in um, and don't be um, uh, don't be looking at those questions and thinking, hey, there are already so many, um, I'll stop now. Because if we have more questions than we can actually answer in the Q&A section, uh, we'll actually come uh, uh, come back to you on that in written form. Um, Andy has graciously <laughs> agreed to uh, take any questions that we cannot cover today um, and write a response to that. So we'll be sharing that. Um, that is uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, now I would like to, of course, welcome our wonderful presenters, Andrew Brogan and Helen Sanderson, um, to this Purpose at Work webinar. Um, Purpose at Work was set up by myself and my two partners, uh, Alan Huff and Caroline El Corso. And our purpose is to help organizations put their purpose at the center, um, of front and center in the way that they work with both their clients and their staff. We're based in Australia and work mo mostly with um, providers in the health and care sector. Um, and one of our key principles is that we want to share information and uh, data between uh, people and organizations. So there is mutual learning about new ways of working and especially better ways of working. And we were introduced to a confirmation practice by one of our wonderful speakers, Helen Sanderson, when she presented at um, events that we were have, having here in Australia. And um, we were struck by um, how simple, but also very powerful and um, different from traditional uh, performance management practices these, these practices were. So uh, we were very interested um, and also a number of our clients were very interested in learning more about these confirmation practices. So once we got the opportunity to do a webinar, not only with Helen, but actually also with Andy, uh, one of the developers of confirmation practices, uh, yeah, we just felt that um, we, 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 sh we should jump on this opportunity and, and do this webinar and organize it for you tonight. Um, Andy uh, is from Easier Inc. and Easier Inc. helps organizations um, be uh, happier and higher performing and where people actually enjoy a greater responsibility, um, shared purpose and the confidence that comes from knowing uh, that they can deliver outstanding uh, performance every day. They uh, do this by uh, helping to create new ways of working and managing uh, that free people to use their initiative equip them to collaborate uh, to pace and support them to operate safely within a framework of good governance. Andy is a founding, is a founding partner of Easier Inc. and um, brings together a heap of uh, improvement approaches across multiple disciplines. Um, and he provides straightforward jargon-free support, uh, which helps people to make sense of complexity, uh, focus on what really matters and create workplaces that where responsibility, mutuality and fellowship flourish. Uh, Andy is a speaker, facilitator, coach and consultant um, and uh, works with uh, organizations from uh, all different sizes 
including well-being teams, um, which is the organization that Helen heads up. Wellbeing Teams is an innovative UK uh, in-home care provider um, that works mostly with the elderly in the community. Um, and they work with self-organizing teams that provide flexible, compassionate care based on what really matters to the people that they are supporting. Helen herself has started her career in OT um, and has worked in social care, healthcare, and education, and then as a, an advisor to governments. She is a recognized expert in person-centered approaches, um, both in her home base of the UK, but also internationally, including here in Australia. She's founded the social enterprise Helen Sanderson Associates and a charity called Community Circles. And next to all that also has managed to write over 20 books and uh, get a PhD. Uh, and she is now putting all that learning and insight um, and wisdom into uh, well-being teams and through that helping to support um, a different way of providing um, health and care in the UK. So uh, with that, I'd like to um, hand over to um, Andy. I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to you. Thanks, Yumi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all this morning. Really appreciate that. I hope you're going to find this useful. Uh, just to reiterate what Yumi said, any questions that we can't get to in the course of the call, I'm really happy to respond to. Um, either in writing or you can contact me direct and we can have a, a web chat or, or whatever is most appropriate to you. So uh, one way or another, we will answer your questions. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so I can walk you through some stuff around confirmation practices. So hopefully the technology is on our side. Let me try this. Um, can I ask you to wave at me if you can see some slides on screen? Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, so um, we've got quite a lot of content to cover. Uh, I tried to distill it down to the things that I think are essential. So I'm going to go at a reasonable pace. Uh, you can have the slides following the presentation as well to, to look back at. The things I want to cover are what are confirmation practices? How do they work? Um, I also though want to go into what problems do they solve because my experience of using them has been the people that have been most successful in using them have really had a deep appreciation of what are they an, an, an antidote to. Um, so I think understanding the, the problems that these uh, confirmation practices are trying to address is a great way to learn about how to use them and how to get started with them. Um, finally, before the Q&A session, I'm going to invite Helen to talk about her experience of implementing confirmation practices and the challenges and practical issues that throws up. So hopefully that sounds like a good spread of content. Um, so to get started then, what are confirmation practices? Um, this is the way I think of them. First of all, they're, they're simple routines for reflective practice. So um, simple because reflective practice in my experience can get um, quite in depth and quite turgid. Uh, so uh, the way these work is to keep it super high level, super simple. Routine because I think it's about making a habit of it rather than it being a one-off or ad hoc experience and reflective practice rather than feedback. So one of the things we'll touch on in the presentation is, in my view, feedback is largely toxic. Um, there are environments and ways in which to provide feedback that, that can be useful. Uh, but my experience has been reflective practice is a much more helpful way to um, encourage people's contribution, encourage responsibility, and help people take ownership of their work. So simple routines for reflective practice. Secondly, which make it easy to discuss the undiscussables. So I'm sure you've all had experiences, uh, certainly I've had experiences at work where the elephant's in the room, but nobody will point at it. Um, and, and, you know, the, the aim here is to make it not only obvious that the ele elephant's in the room, but to make that an explicit um, permitted subject of discussion so that we don't have these things rumbling on and creating friction between us. The other side of the elephant in the room is, you know, are we focused on what really matters or are we kind of spinning the wheels, uh, polishing away at things that, that really at the end of the day are not what we're here to achieve. So this ties to Yumi's point about purpose at work. Are we focused on the things that really are about our purpose? 
again, confirmation practices try and make it much easier to stay focused on what really matters by simply um, orientating the, the focus of confirmation practices around the things that we know make a difference. So again, I'll come back to that later. And the key mechanism in confirmation practices, from my point of view, is the use of statements about what good looks like ahead of measures. So I'll talk in a minute about why that's important, but the essence of it is that natural language, in other words, statements, descriptions, um, is a much richer medium than uh, metrics, uh, and therefore helping people to describe what good looks like in ways that are shared and common to them uh, is actually, in my experience, something that is uh, unexpectedly powerful and can really help to create a sense of mutuality, fellowship, common purpose, and so on. Last and by no means least, uh, the whole purpose of doing this is to help people learn and then take action. Uh, and in particular, those two things together, learn through action. Um, so while confirmation practices themselves involve sense making, reflective practice, discussion, the orientation is towards action and action learning. And again, hopefully you'll see that in some of the examples that I'll share. So let, let's do that now. So uh, an example. So there are four types of confirmation practices. I'll, I'll take you through the four in a minute. This is the first, uh, I think, easiest type to get hold of. I call it checkout practices. Um, and where checkout practices tend to be useful is in meetings. Um, so one of my clients, Saskia Dorman, put this lovely sketch note together describing the routine around how you do checkout practices. So imagine we're in a meeting. It could be this one and we're approaching the end of the meeting we've had some good conversations we've made some decisions um, and what we're going to do is put aside some time at the end uh, where the facilitator or chair is going to read out a set of pre-prepared statements that specifically target what really matters about the outcomes of that meeting or the process of that meeting uh, and perhaps also specifically targets things where we know that we tend not to be good at pointing at the elephant in the room. So the kinds of statements they might use would be things like, um, are we setting out to work on the right things? Yeah. So we've made some decisions together, we've made some plans. The chair is now going to ask, are we setting out to work on the right things? And in asking that, what we'll all do is on our notepad, we'll just give a score from one to five, where one is, no, we are absolutely not setting out to work on the right things. In fact, they're the worst things I could conceive of. And five is, these are absolutely the best plans I've ever come up with. I'm so excited to get out there and get started. Yeah. So, so the routine here is super simple. Chair's reading out a few pre-prepared statements. They're not waiting for everyone to think about it and ponder. They're looking for a gut feel, so people give their scores very quickly on their pads. And then the chair will stop and go around the room and will say, okay, for statement one that I read out, what were your scores? And they'll do a round robin. And on a flip chart or a whiteboard, they'll just put the scores up. Uh, and then for statement two, what were the scores? And all of this is done without discussion what the scores are or, or why they are. It's just getting them up and getting them public. And what that does is it creates this common, um, you know, visible artifact for everyone where they can look at the board, they know what the statements were, and they can see that people's scores vary or that they don't vary. Um, and what I found doing this is that it's a, a very simple but useful provocation for people to talk about for example, where the scores vary, what is it that they're seeing and experiencing that's different? And therefore, where do we need greater clarity or where do we need to kind of unearth issues that weren't resolved in the meeting? Or where scores are the same, but they're low, it tells us that nobody's really happy leaving the room. So let's not pretend that the meeting has achieved its purpose. We've got more work to do. Um, but, the, but the essence of it is, it's just giving people explicit permission to say, things are going the way they should, we're achieving what we expected to, or actually our process is off track somewhat. That, that's so simple that sometimes when I introduce it to people, they think, well, you know, it, it can't be that straightforward. Surely fear plays a part and people don't want to talk about these things and so on and so forth. I have to say, I, I kind of expected that that would be true myself the first few times I did this. 
Uh, but my experience to date has been the opposite. My experience to date has been when you make it explicit that the scores of one to five are completely subjective and that you want people to give low scores if they feel low scores because this is about how people feel rather than about an objective truth. Um, it, it's extraordinary the permission that gives and how forthcoming people seem to be. So my experience to date has been that doing this towards the end of meetings almost every time surfaces stuff that people weren't talking about and it leads to really productive, quite straightforward, practical discussions about how can we improve on the thing that's not right here. So that's checkout practices. Um, behind the sketch note, there's a template that I sometimes use. So this gives you an example of the sorts of statements that you might use in a checkout practice. Um, and along the top there, you can see how it, it works out. But um, you don't have to use templates like this. Using a flip chart or whiteboard can be just as productive. Um, that's checkout practices. So as I said, there are, there are four types of confirmation practice though. So checkout practices are one. Um, process confirmation I want to give you an example of, and then I'll come back to the other two. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of process confirmation. So if you haven't kind of clocked it by now, the reason they're called confirmation practices is that what we're doing is we're confirming that things are going the way that we want them to go. We're confirming that we're achieving what good looks like. Um, so in this example, I was working with a hospital trust and some GPs. Uh, this was where um, basically GPs were requesting uh, pathology tests to be done by a lab, things like blood work and so on. Um, and they knew their process wasn't working very well, but they didn't have a common language to describe that. So we started with um, what's the purpose of your process and they came up with the statement at the top, basically helping people make informed decisions about their care. And then we said, well, look, what, what would you want to be true at the beginning of this process when you're requesting tests? And we said, well, we shouldn't request tests unless they're necessary, unless the person that they're for has made an informed choice to have those tests. And unless we're asking a clear clinical question, otherwise we're just going on a fishing trip with no real idea of what we might find or why. And lastly, we should send our tests in with a valid sample, otherwise we can't get a valid result. So as we worked through the process, we said, you know, there's a beginning to the process, a middle and an end. So let's describe what good looks like at each of those stages. And then let's use those as our confirmation practice. So we translated those statements into a little template like this. And all we did was we brought people from the lab together with people from general practice who were requesting the tests and we invited them to do the one to five scores privately. Um, and then we invited them to call out their scores and then have a discussion about why they saw the differences and why we saw the similarities in scores. And what was really extraordinary was when they did this, um, they almost universally said, you know what, every request that I put in, um, I can safely say, that it never is submitted with a valid clinical question because that's not how we request tests. What we do is we tell the lab to do the bloods. We don't tell them why to do the bloods, what it is that we're trying to find out and answer. And therefore, what we end up doing in the lab, for example, is we end up running loads of different blood work and sending back this deluge of results and then expecting that the clinician can make sense of them. When in actual fact, we could do something much more targeted, much more clear, um, and with some real clinical advice from us as experts in pathology and what these results mean. So, so simply describing what good looks like in this way in natural language, again, in my experience, it leads to different conversations and different insights. And very often it leads to very much more targeted conversations and insights. So one of the consequences of using this confirmation template was that actually the volume of requesting into this particular lab dropped by 40%, uh, but the amount of pathology that they found, in other words, the amount of ill health they found stayed the same. So they could be confident that they were doing um, necessary and sufficient testing to pick up on the health needs of people without doing all the over-testing and harm that that causes. 
So that's process confirmation. Now, now to give you a different example, um, here's one that comes from the world of social care. Uh, the template's a bit different. I personally really like this. This is from the same lady that did the sketch note I shared a moment ago around checkout practices. Um, she said that in, in her work, one of the most important things that happens is the process of um, traditionally called assessment, but she's moved away from that and calls it having a what matters conversation. So she's out there talking to people about what matters to them. And she just wants to know that that process, that conversation is leading to a common understanding. So she takes this bit of paper out with her um, and on the little spider diagram on the, the dots there, she invites the person or the family or whatever to, to score their, their view against the statements. And in the boxes, they capture what are they going to do about that and what are they learning through the conversation. And they just keep going around this wheel as part of their routine practice. So this is, in essence, um, a way in which Saski, the person who created this, has found to uh, anchor her practice into confirmation practices. So she essentially uh, uses this as her assessment paperwork and as her confirmation practice, and she uses it in her multidisciplinary teams, and she uses it to share this information with other people who are supporting the family. So I think it's quite a nice example of how confirmation practices can be integral in the work, not something that just happens in meetings. Okay. So before I come back to the last two types of confirmation practice, you may have spotted there's a bit of a routine around what these are and how to use them. And, and this is the way I would describe it. So once you have your confirmation statements, the, the key thing to do is to reflect on them. And I find it really helpful to invite people that are involved in the process or the meeting or whatever we're using the confirmation practice to reflect privately first rather than reflecting together. So we're going to sit and consider how does the world look to me against these statements? And I'm going to think a little bit about why does it look that way? And then I'm going to score them one to five, uh, accepting that that score is completely subjective and means nothing, but it's just a way for us to show that we see the world the same way or see something different. Then what we're going to do is we're going to help ourselves and each other collectively reframe our view of what's going on because we can only see the world from where we see it until we start to listen and empathize with each other. So the reframing happens when we share our scores and our reasons for them. And sometimes it's also useful to bring other data into the conversation. So we might, in the pathology example, bring data about you know, what volume of requests are being requested by different GPs and are there patterns there, are there similarities or differences? But the key thing in my view is that the data comes second. The data is in service to answering a question rather than the data being a score to be kept. So, so this is quite a deliberate um, thing here that we don't start with the data, we start with how the world looks to each of us, yeah? that that's key thing in terms of giving permission and creating the safety to share what we are seeing and why we're seeing it. So in the reframing stage we're sharing perspectives, we're empathizing with each other, we're looking at data together that helps us put the statements into context um, and the job really is how can we make sense of all of this stuff that we're seeing and as we make sense of it together as we create some shared meaning we then move into the third phase, which is to respond by saying, well, what can we do? And sometimes there's nothing left to do because actually making sense of it together was the action we needed to take. We've just grown some common understanding. Um, but often there's much sort of simpler actions to happen. You know, it's just a case of we need to go and find out more about X or we need to run a test of change around how would we change in the pathology example from never uh, stating a clinical question to starting to state a clinical question and see what happens. So that, that's the routine. I hope that makes sense. Just to briefly come back to the four types. So I've talked about checkout practices, talked about process confirmation. The third type, um, which is the type that I think Helen and I and wellbeing teams have most closely focused on is role confirmation. And this is where we start with somebody's role and responsibilities and we help them develop statements about what matters in their role. How do they know that they're on track with the contribution that they're trying to make? 
but the routine is the same. It's just statements about what matters, reflecting, reframing, and then responding. Lastly, second order confirmation practices. I always slightly cringe when I say this, it's a bit jargony, um, but all it means is a process by which we confirm that we are using our other confirmation practices appropriately. So essentially what it tends to look like is someone will observe people. So in a, in a checkout practice, for example, someone might observe the checkout practice happening and then share back with the group what they observed. So did we listen to each other? You know, did we cut each other off or shut each other down too quickly? Um, do the actions we framed follow from the conversation we've had? Those sorts of things. So second order confirmation practices are a way of just helping us to practice and get expert at the other first order confirmation practices. I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm going to move on from there to discuss a little bit about why do I think that approach that I've described works and what do I think it's an antidote to? As I said at the top, I, I think understanding what it's an antidote to is a really good way into using them well. Um, so when it comes to problems, uh, there's actually way more than six, but here's six and I thought I'd focus on a couple of them. Um, so the first one, um, I'll not read these out, but I, I suspect I will be preaching to the converted here that, you know, we know that um, measures in organisations can be uh, used and abused. Um, and I have to say, in, in every organisation I've worked in, uh, it has been the case that they may be measuring better or worse things, but they are never, ever, ever measuring purpose. And there's a reason for that. I think you cannot measure purpose. You can measure all sorts of dimensions that inform us and give us insight about purpose, but you can't measure purpose itself. And that I think is critically important. So if we go from some of these examples on screen and their sort of shadow side to a little diagram for how I think about performance and purpose, that I think performance exists beyond the results that we use to describe it. So all those little bubbles that we have in this diagram about risk and demand and service and so on, they're all really important. I would say we do want measures of these things. So I'm not arguing that we shouldn't measure. Uh, but what I would really like you to grab hold of is that in measuring, what we're not doing is measuring performance. We're measuring aspects of our work that help us to reach a conclusion about what our performance is. So performance is in my jargon in the round it's that gray circle that sits around the outside edge it's therefore an emergent property of all of these different domains of performance and therefore it requires sense making and judgment yeah so it's simply not true that we can look at a metric and say we're performing well we have to look at lots of metrics in the context of having clarity of purpose and to then form a judgment about whether we're performing well or not now, why is that important? Well, in my view, it's important because in most organizations, we don't treat data like that. We treat data as a score to be kept and therefore turn performance into a game to be played. Um, and the consequence of that is even more profound in my view, which is we have organizations running around um, not knowing they're performing badly because their data is within the tolerance that they've set. So one of my clients, a really great guy, Peter Goff, worked in Zurich Insurance. He was the chief operating officer. And when I first started working with him, his comment to me was, um, Andy, I know my data is lying to me because my dashboard is a sea of green. You know, everything is green. It's five gold stars. And yet I talk to my customers and they say they're not happy. So how can that be true? And the simple answer is the paradox of the faulty test that no matter what we're measuring, we're not measuring purpose, therefore treating the measures as the test of success leads us down a blind alley. Secondly, I think there are cultural implications to that though, which is, you know, we, when we start to behave towards the data as if it's telling us the truth, we create this culture of fake news where our organization is telling itself the story it wants to hear, not the, the story that's real. 
And that then starts to create an environment in which people don't really believe the data. They think it's there to be manipulated. So actually the value we can get from data is diminished. And I think the most critical problem here is the loss of trust. And I've experienced this firsthand. I'd be interested in your experiences. But, you know, again, I, I worked in an organization with some genuinely fantastic leadership. But every time they took the stage at staff events, they would talk about the results and they would proclaim how great things were and they would pat everyone in the back. And I would look around the audience and I would see these vocationally driven people that knew that the leaders were good people. Um, but I could see them losing trust because the story they were hearing from the stage wasn't the story they were experiencing live in the work. So, so my view is confusing results with performance leads us into this world of telling each other stories that are fictions and therefore managing fictions and therefore not really connecting to the truth that's in each other. Uh, the reason I think confirmation practices get away from that is because they put data second and they put sense making first. So I hope that makes sense to you because I think it's really important to how you use confirmation practices and how you use data within them. Speeding on then, uh, I'm going to take the next three problems together. Uh, just to describe problem number two there briefly, uh, I think we, we commonly overestimate the control that we have as individuals over performance. Um, that in most situations, performance is much more about how we interact and collaborate and operate within an environment than it is about what we ourselves do. Uh, so I just want to describe that quickly to you by giving you an example. So, so let's imagine, this is a real example for what it's worth, but let's imagine you're in a, a, an organization that does repairs to people's homes. So uh, I can see a few names there. So Amanda, perhaps uh, you're a plumber. <laughs> yeah. And Donna, maybe you're an electrician. And Helen, maybe you're a, a joiner. Um, and in this organization, calls come into the call center uh, from people who are saying there's something broken in my house and we send a tradesperson out to do some repair work and this is just a count of for each day of the week how many jobs did you manage to finish that day okay so in a traditional organization if I were the manager I might look at that data on the Monday and go well, okay yeah you, you work pretty hard and then on Tuesday Oh my God, what on earth were you doing? Your productivity nearly halved, yeah? But I, I might tolerate that and think, well, maybe it was just a bad day. By the time Wednesday comes, I'm pinning you to a wall and saying, what the hell's going on, yeah? And then I know that that was the right thing to do because on Thursday, things get better. And by Friday, you've really pulled your socks up, yeah? <laughs> so I'm caricaturing a bit, of course, but but that's not unlike um, the psychology of work in many organizations where we focus on productivity. So what I'd like you to do for a minute is you can type this into the, the chat functionality if you want, or you can come off mute for a second and shout out. But let's imagine that you're those tradespeople. What, what would influence the number of jobs that you're able to do in any one day? Any ideas? bookings that come through or that are scheduled or clients that are available absolutely yes the the number of jobs that are available to do would be one <laughs> yeah uh, maybe also reading into what you said the variety of jobs they're not all created equal so some will take longer than others any more uh, i can't see the texts coming through sadly so maybe if i can ask you to just shout them out if anyone's got contributions uh, the location of the jobs absolutely yes yeah. so how far is it from my base how far are they from each other because that will add travel time yeah any more yeah Somebody my car oh sorry uh, my car broke down and uh majorly disrupted that day Okay, absolutely, yeah, and, and just to build on that, there's loads around um, the, the sort of travel, so it could be problems with my car, the distance between the jobs we've mentioned, could be that there are roadworks, I get stuck in traffic, um, so, you know, loads of things there. Any more folks? Uh, 
Um, the quality of the work done. Yeah, yeah. So on Friday, you know, you gave me a good kick on Wednesday. Uh, on Thursday and Friday, basically what I did was just a really bad job. I just, you know, slapped a few bits of wood on a wall with some 10-inch nails and, and left. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, just okay. The, okay. Sorry, I missed that. That that was another one, was it? I'm, okay, I, I'll keep moving in the interest of time, but something to, to note about the examples you're giving is um, none of those are materially within the control of the tradesperson that's being sent to do the job, yeah? Except from maybe the quality of the work, yeah? But actually, in the context of an environment where my job gives me a kick if I don't get enough jobs done, the quality of the work is more a product of that environment, arguably, than it is of my professional capability. And in the real world example that this is taken from, that's exactly what we saw. We saw tradespeople under pressure to get jobs done. So what they did was they did half a job and then closed the ticket and went to the next one. And then the call would come back into the call center and be allocated to a different tradesperson who would go out and finish the other half of the job. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of mad, right? Um, but my point here is that when we look at any system of work, it's typically the case that up to about 95% of the causes of variation in the work exist either in the nature of the task or in the environment that surrounds the task, not in the agency of the individual. Now, I think that's really important because it throws up a conundrum for us, which I think of as the control conundrum, which is if my work as an individual doesn't really make that much difference to the performance of my organisation, why on earth would I give a damn? Yeah, that's quite demotivating for me to think that, you know, it's just my environment. I'm just a cog in the machine. And, and yet it's hard to escape the reality that the machine I'm in has a major bearing on the performance I'm able to achieve. Yeah. So I think the solution to this control conundrum is rather than um, focusing on the performance of individuals, what we can do is give people a voice in focusing on the performance of the system of which they are a part. And therefore we can help people into these sense-making conversations where they talk about the things that get in the way of themselves being able to do a good job. And when we do that, what we do is we unlock an internal locus of control. In other words, we give people a sense that they have the power, they have the authority, they have the agency to make a real difference. But the way they're going to make a real difference is by helping to reshape the system and the ways of working that they are part of. Um, I, I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, just to put a slight caveat on it. Of course, there are things that individuals can do in the context of just their own tasks that will make a difference. But the point I'm making here is that when looked at from a helicopter point of view, typically it's the ways of working, the environment, the system of work that is the bigger lever for improvement. So if we want to get most bang for our buck, we need to give, we need to give people a voice in changing the system of work, not just in polishing the bit that they can control. So in stark terms, this is the control conundrum and, and my view of the answer to it. So I would encourage you to bear this in mind in your confirmation practices, because what you're doing is you're trying to move people out of a world of accountability for their performance into a world of responsibility for the system and how it performs. So give people control of the system rather than control your people and I guarantee you, you will get better performance. Okay, I'm going to speed through this and then we'll come to Helen. So last one, uh, funny thing about outcomes, they're outcomes. Um, so another way to think of that is they're symptoms. Um, if you want healthy organisations, don't manage symptoms. Um, in the same way that if we want healthy bodies, don't manage symptoms. Yeah, you have to get to what's creating the health. 
So the way to get to the health is to focus on that thing in the middle, the social purpose. And one way to do that is to do this process, I call it left shifting of thinking about the results or outcomes and then going left and asking what are the few things we need to be good at that would make a healthy system that produces those outcomes. And then left again into the patterns, which are basically um, what makes it easier or harder for us to be good at the things we need to be good at. Let me stick with my repairs example and speed through. So in the repairs example, we are interested in how many jobs get done, how happy our customers are, what it costs to repair things, etc. But left shifting to the few things we need to be good at tells us that the things we need to do well are sending the right trade, because if we send the wrong one, they'll never get the job done. Um, at a time that's convenient, because if it's not convenient, guess what, we don't get in. Uh, with the stuff they need to do the job because otherwise they can't do it um, and with the time and space that they need to be able to actually complete the repair in one visit rather than being rushed to the next job. Now that sim sounds so simple that you would think it's obvious and yet systemically in the UK at least nobody does that. Nobody measures those things, nobody talks about those things, everybody worries about how many jobs are we repeat, um, uh, completing and essentially bullies people into it. So when you're developing your confirmation statements, the trick here is this left shifting thing. Focus on what are the few things we need to be good at to achieve our purpose and you'll find that that creates constancy of purpose you'll find that that helps you see through the fog of all the things you could manage to just get focused on what are the things that really, really matter. So if that's problems that it solves, how do you get started? Um, a few tips. Uh, first one, be really clear on the mission. This is why I think understanding the problems is important. Um, this is the way I conceive of it. You know, you, you're trying to create a new environment for work, one that takes people out of behaviours where they feel they need to justify their performance or attribute uh, blame to others or defend their position and into one where they actively want to share what's happening because they know this is an opportunity to discover um, and to improve. Uh, so I think of it as a shift from accountability to responsible practice. Be clear about the roles. So in my view, everybody has two roles. Um, they have a leadership role, which is to stand up for what really matters. So let's not sit in silence and you know, not point at the elephant in the room. Let, let's understand that it's everybody's job to not just point at the elephant, but to name it and to talk about it. Um, and fellowship, which is to recognize that in pointing at the elephant in the room, others might have a different perspective. So we really need to practice empathy with each other and we really need to give a damn about each other because that's what creates the safe space in which we can share. And in enacting those roles, the practical focus if confirmation practices is to help each other to develop the skills and habits for noticing, for thinking, for empathizing and for acting from mutuality. So I talked about second order confirmation practices earlier. When I'm using second order practices, this is what I'm focused on. This is what I'm watching for. You know, are we behaving towards each other in ways that are helping to nurture these skills and habits in each other? Or are we closing each other down, shutting each other off, telling each other that they're wrong? Yeah, because the more we create this safe space to discover, share and contribute, um, through confirmation practices or indeed through any other method, the more likely we are to improve. So if that's the mission, the next steps are really genuinely very straightforward. Um, start with listening to each other, you know, what matters around here, who matters around here then start to sort of do that left shifting, stripping it back. If those are the things that matter in the context of our purpose, then what are the few things we would need to be brilliant at? Sending the right trade with the right tools, that sort of stuff. And if they're the few things we need to be great at, what do we know about where undiscussables lurk or what makes those things easier or hard? Because if we 
map that stuff out and, and for clarity sometimes you can do this in a single conversation this doesn't need to be a long process but if you map that stuff out framing some statements becomes really easy you know and you can do it in conversation with each other i think framing some statements together in your workplace is a really powerful thing to do because it helps people take ownership of these confirmation statements are describing what we collectively agree matters around here um, and then when you've got your statements it's just a case of practicing yeah so um so you can use whatever template you want um but go back to that routine i talked about at the top of reflecting privately then reframing together and then responding by deciding where we need to act or what we need to clarify and the more you do it the easier it becomes um, it doesn't need to take long. It, in fact, it shouldn't take long. My experience of doing this is this is a five to ten minute job each time that we do it. Um, but it's, it's extraordinarily powerful in my experience as a way to get beyond looking at our performance through the lens of just numbers and, and instead building this sense of fellowship, shared sense making and collective responsibility for purpose. Okay. So with all that said i hope that's been useful i know there's an awful lot more depth we could go into but i think it's useful for you to now hear from helen who i'm going to invite to talk to us a bit about her experience of doing this in well-being teams and some of the challenges she's faced so helen if you're there um can i ask you just to to kind of launch into that and describe you know what what has worked well for you and and where have the challenges been Absolutely. Thank you, Andy. If, if I start by just giving an overview of how we're using confirmation practices in wellbeing teams, we're using them in two ways for process and roles. So I'm part of a national team uh, that, that supports the local wellbeing teams. And in the national team, we have different roles. So therefore, we have different confirmation practices. We have a tactical meeting every two weeks and 15 minutes of that is dedicated to our confirmation practices. Um, we rotate buddies, so every two weeks I'll have a different buddy that I'll be working with. The expectation is that I've completed my confirmation practices and done my scores before the meeting, and the 15 minute together with my buddy is supporting and challenging each other on the scores that we've given um, and what we're going to, to do about it. So the last time I did this, I was buddied with Emily. I'd scored myself three for something and she challenged me and we actually, for the first time, moved my score from three to four. So I think one of the challenges and opportunities is being absolutely rigorous around what constitutes five um, so, and what data you'll be looking at to, um, to confirm those statements. So that's been, been really, uh, powerful for us it, it changes my practice and for me that's the ultimate with confirmation practices is it influencing what I'm doing week by week um, and it's certainly doing that and what we do at the end of our national team meetings is we have a slack channel and we have an I will channel as part of our slack um, so at the end of the day on a Friday we post the two things that we're going to be focusing on as a result of our confirmation practices over the next two weeks so we've got transparency over that and we can support each other so nationally that's working really um, really well for us we're also doing it not just around roles but around processes so here which you won't be able to read but i just want to show you that it exists we have um, 10 statements which are our team agreements and we get together physically in the room uh, once every three months. It's happening this Friday. And we'll be using confirmation practices around our team agreements. So we'll be scoring ourselves on a one to five on how well we're delivering our team agreement and then having a group discussion about it. So we started off just doing it on a roles based um, approach. And now we're moving to doing it around team agreements, not on a fortnightly basis, on a less frequent basis, but as a way of making sure um, they stay live. It's been more challenging doing it in well-being teams with our team members um, and we've, we've found that for, for a couple of reasons. So, the, so we have a golden thread, we think, between um, the adverts that you'll see us recruiting to, the role descriptions that we recruit people to, what's in people's contracts 
and the confirmation practices. So we've got six statements in our confirmation practices that represent the heart of, of what we expect. So the first thing is, and when we very first started using them, we hadn't explained well enough why we were using these particular statements. So even though they're obvious to me, and this has been a great part of my personal learning over the, the last two years, particularly what is obvious to me is not necessarily obvious to everybody else. And I'm having to, to work much harder at making that explicit. And some of that is because I'm an introvert. So I do my, my thinking and processing internally. So I'm, I'm working at, at, at changing my behavior around that. So we then added an additional column to our confirmation practices to make it explicit how that confirmation practice statement related to the values of well-being teams. So we would say we are asking this question because it relates to our value of responsibility and compassion. So the first thing we needed to do was to get better at why this was important um, to do. The second one was needing to get better at defining what five looked like. So the first time that we used them, uh, one um, couple, uh, two buddies that worked together in the wellbeing teams at Wigan, both confidently scored themselves five in each area, which is a surprise to us because that didn't tally with what we were observing um, from their behavior. So the next thing we needed to do is for each confirmation practice be really, really clear about what five looked like. So you had data or evidence to support or challenge um, and that changed things as well. So we have a crib sheet that says what five looked like. The other um, thing that we wanted to do is, is to explore transparency with everybody in a team. So if you've got a team of eight, if you're just doing confirmation practices every fortnight with your buddy, we don't get a sense of overall how we're all doing and how we can support each other. So we then developed a sort of big poster with confirmation practices and we'll get people to come and put their scores up with stickies against the confirmation practices, be able to see overall how we were doing and then going into pairs with your um, buddy to talk about what you were going to do differently as a result of your confirmation practices over the next um, two weeks. So that helped getting a balance of working together in pairs and greater transparency across a whole team. Um, but there are two things that we're still working on um, that are challenging um, to us. One is, how do you keep them fresh um, and alive? And um, what we intend to do is in our, our person-centered team review, once every six months, go back to our confirmation practices and say, are we still focusing on the right things? Do we want to change or adjust our confirmation practices? So they're owned by teams and therefore we might get uh, diversity across different teams. That, that's a challenge for me um, because CQC, our regulator, have specific expectations um, around our roles. And I want to make sure that our confirmation practices stay true to our values and what's expected of us, as well as team members being able to change them to reflect their, their current priorities. So, so that's gonna be interesting to explore as we move forward. But the biggest thing is um, actually relates to the slide you just shared, um, Andy. How do we enable people to compassionately challenge but challenge with confidence given our cultures in teams broadly in social care and health is um, we really really want to be nice to each other and therefore we're like often like to be too nice and less challenging and how do we pull that back to wanting to support each other to be rigorous and, and challenging and, and support and challenge um, role um, and then if we do feel confident to our challenge, doing that in a way that's compassionate and not laden with blame. Um, so for us, connecting confirmation practices with nonviolent communication skills or compassionate communication skills is really, really critical. And we realize that we need to do more around supporting people to coach um, in those environments and to get better and better at developing our skills around compassionate communication um, because we aren't a so what we also tried was the well-being leader the coaches in our well-being teams being able to go around and eavesdrop in the conversations and actually although theoretically 
that's an excellent thing to do practically we've not been able um, to achieve that so i am fundamentally wedded to this being a much much better alternative to supervision uh, and annual appraisal in the way that i've seen it work traditionally in organizations um, and we've still got some, a way to go to it, feet, it delivering all that it promises but the most significant thing for me is it changes my behavior I have different visibility on what people intend to do as a result of those confirmation practices. So in wellbeing teams, we also have a Slack channel where people are posting what they intend to work on to improve their practice over the next two weeks. And that's, that's really um, where the rubber hits the road for me. Is it helping us figure out where and how we want to improve? And are we doing that in a way that's transparent to people and we can support each other? Come back to you, Andy. Thank you, Helen. Uh, I'll maybe ask you just one more question before we turn it over to questions. But it, it, you know what? What's I think really helpful in what you're sharing there is, um, you know, inevitably doing this stuff, however simple it appears, you know, you hit bumps in the road, right? That, that's just always going to be the case. Um, and all, all the things you mentioned there, you know. Um, are absolutely bang on around things like compassionate communication and, and coaching and so on so you know if we had a second webinar we could, we could go into a lot of that but my second question to you would be um if you were starting from sort of now knowing what you know now is there anything specifically you would have done differently in approaching confirmation practices yes in the way that i introduce them so you've talked about how you can co-develop confirmation practices with people and i think that's really really important but because we were a startup we wanted to have them in place um, and the people that we were working with weren't through probation at that stage and therefore it, it felt too much to be saying to people now develop your confirmation practices and if it was me i'd be going but you know isn't this stuff designed so it would look too wobbly for people i think so what i would have done differently is in introducing confirmation practices i would have drawn a much clearer line to purpose and values so in order to deliver our purpose these are things that we need you to be really really good at and in order to live our values this is why we're talking about those things um, so in the way that it's introduced the links between purpose and values are the critical bits i think well, thank you. I think that's super helpful because I know one of the questions that was posted in advance of today's webinar was how do you introduce them? Um, and, and Helen's essentially said it that, you know, my experience of this is that the ideal way to introduce them is that actually teams develop them themselves by working together on what is our purpose and what really matters that underpins that. But in the context of a new organisation like Helen's, that, that simply wasn't the right thing to do. But you've just heard there are, there are other things you can do in that context. So, um, OK, so look, without further ado, I'm going to close my screen share, take some questions. I know we're to time, but I don't need to rush off. So those that want to stay and ask questions, please do. Um, those that can't, post your questions by text and I'll reply by, by email or by text. So if I just um, close my screen share. Or try to. Okay, there we go. Um, so, folks, do we do we have any questions? So, I've got Yvonne um, asking about the one to five rating. Yvonne, would you, would you like to voice that question for us or is that one you'd like me to reply to privately? Yvonne, if you come off mute for me, sorry. Um, my cons earlier on in the presentation, um, it was stated um, at one point to ask about the one, to five rating scale. Um, I've worked with many organizations on their performance manage management systems. And um, I find that a rating scale um, becomes really contentious 
because people don't actually understand what a one means versus a five and that three is good. So I suppose my question is, um, is there some definition behind that? I mean, we spoke about purpose and values. So can we actually, rather than work on a one to five system, can we put some um, uh, dialogue about that? What, um, rather than use a one to five, what that means? Because in all my experience in my HR roles, um, people get fixated by num numbers. You know, people think if I say a three, you know, that's not good enough, so I need to push it up to a four or vice versa. So I would like to see um, some definition and dialogue put around that. Yeah, so I think it's a really good question. Uh, it's something I've experimented with. So, yeah. um, so I think it's definitely an area that I would encourage you all to experiment with if you if you yeah. use this approach. Um, I, I guess my observations so far in terms of things I've tested, when when I took away the the rating scale, what I found was people. Uh, took much much longer to get into um, the meat of the conversation so it does seem to be quite an expedient way to get people talking uh, mm. however Helen also touched on um, you know that they're using essentially definitions checklists etc behind what what would constitute a five so I, I do think there is value in crystallizing um, you know what do we mean when we say one yeah. what do we mean when we say five I think you can do that a couple of ways. So in, in the example of Saski, that the, the sketch notes that I shared, we've treated, um, we've treated that clarity as an outcome of the discussions rather than as an input to the discussions, but we're very, very explicit that what we're doing with the confirmation practices is trying to discover shared meaning. So, yeah, so yeah. it's kind of on the table at the outset that that's what we're yeah. trying to do. So, I think I think the one thing I would say about the one to five scale is if you use it, it is absolutely essential that it is positioned as we are deliberately looking for subjective experiences here. Um, so so the number you give doesn't matter. No one is putting a value judgment on the number. The number is just to help you kind of talk about your emotions about the situation. Andy, can I add that the critical thing is, is that numbers aren't aggregated or checked week yeah. to week or reported on by the managers. Um, so, so I have no idea what people um, score themselves on the last two weeks or three weeks because we don't track that. And that's absolutely critical that it's not tracked as a performance measure. It is purely a self-reflection um, for, for self-reflection. Absolutely. Maybe one last thing I'd add as well is... Um, I think the one to five rating in my experience works really well in the context of checkout practices and process confirmation. Um, I think it works less well in role confirmation because of the reasons you, you, you're describing because the, the numbers start to feel like they attach to me somewhat. Yeah. Um, but in checkout practices and process confirmation, that's not true. You're describing something out there. Yeah. Uh, look, I will admit, um, Helen touched on that and my Wi-Fi and I had to reset so I didn't miss some of that conversation. Um, mm. Yeah, but clearly, you know, if um, team members are going to go into this discuss discussion, um, you know, I, I've just found in my own HR experience when it comes around numbers rather than a real understanding of what a three means versus a one to five. Yep. Yeah, people get confused and, and, and there becomes conflict. And I take everything else on board about the discussions within the team. But if we start from a place of numbers, just from my own experience, people start to get fixated on numbers. So you, you'll not get disagreement from here. Um, so I, I think, again, hopefully you get the spirit in which I'm um, offering this, which is this, this isn't 
dogma for you to uh, yeah. to go and you know comply with. It, it, it it's hopefully a set of practices that you can experiment with and adapt yeah. to your context. Yeah. I, so I, thank you for question. Sorry, I I've just also I'd like, like to say back to Yvonne. Hello, Helen. Uh, hello. Um, is that when you put it in the context of everything else and about bringing the whole self to work and doing things very differently, these numbers are, are not what they are in traditional kind of performance based appraisals and those kind of things. So I guess that's where I would think um, based on what I've heard and what I'm trying to do. Um, Andy and Helen, just in terms of when you're looking at, here's my question and thank you, it's brilliant. Um, uh, to be touching base with you from the other side of the, the world. Um, just in terms of when you've got an organisation that is already doing um, the way they've already done things, um, things are already set up, just some ways of being able to help, if we're talking about kind of a groundswell, which we're doing at one door, but in terms of just some ways of being able to help people take this up in small chunks and and little things that's not too much like they're feeling like this is my goodness i'm jumping in the water for the first time i don't know how to swim and this is bizarre and i don't want to do this um so just some kind of little tips yeah um i'll give you a couple i'm sure helen will have some as well um so the the first one is uh I found it really useful to start with checkout practices because it doesn't require you to really, you know, change all the architecture of your performance management system. Um, so simply introducing that at the end of one or two kind of routine meetings that you have, I think is a good, easy way in. Um, so I might suggest you start with that. Um, a second thought is in the context of um, you know an annual performance review or a one-to-one -one discussion or something like that um, if you're in a more traditional organization where that's between if you like a manager and a, a colleague um, one of the things that a manager can do which really helps is to invite the colleague to start to describe from their perspective what do they think good looks like in their role what matters to them um, and the reason I think that's useful is, for me, a lot of what's going on under the surface in confirmation practices is about helping people to tune into value and to form their own view and their own judgment about what value looks like. So, so even if you're not going to change anything else in terms of your performance management system, inviting people to describe what good looks like from their perspective is, a, I think, really powerful and a simple place to start. I would start with the executive team, um, Cathy. I think if the executive team can uh, clarify their roles in this context, define what good looks like together, start using confirmation practice together, not only could that be transform transformative for the organization, if nothing else, but you'll then be able to speak from experience about what it's like to do them and find the early pitfalls yourself. So that if you then explore it further in the organization, uh, you're doing so from an informed position. Does that help, Cathy? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Great. Okay, um, okay. Any, any more questions? I'm just scanning the chat to see if there's anything I can pick out there. Um, I'm not spotting them, but I will reply to them in text form. So are, are, are there more questions you want to voice for now? And can I ask, add a final comment to Cathy's question? Because I think the where to get started is really important. If you have team agreements, that's another way to get started is using confirmation practices around team agreements. And that would be something that I'd recommend for lots of teams in order to get started moving in this direction. Because as Andy said, um, doing them around processes rather than roles at the beginning can be, can be really useful. Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing other sort of burning questions there, but I, as I say, I will respond to them um, in text form. So uh, I think that's probably it for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Andy. That was, that was great. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, 
I would like to um, yeah, end this with one uh, final slide, which is now, of course, gone. Um, I just wanted to give you all um, a final a final send off, I guess. Um, um, yeah, we, we've run over time, so this is definitely everything that we can cover tonight. Um, I will keep open this session a little bit longer. So if you uh, are still thinking about your question, how to formulate it, um, keep putting it into the chat and we'll find it and send it through to Andy for, so um, he can answer that in writing. Um, we don't want to harass you anymore with any emails if this was uh, enough for you and, and you're happy with where, where we got to. Um, but if you are really keen to um, get the recording, uh, the slides, uh, and potentially some other resources around confirmation practices, then uh, please send us an email uh, on this uh, email address here below. And um, if you could, we would really appreciate if you can, in that email, not only say, yes, give me the resources, but if you could also share your thoughts on this webinar in general, uh, confirmation practices, what were you, what were you thinking as, as you were listening to this webinar, um, and any other topics that you potentially would like us to cover in a webinar in the future. Um, and if you um, send us that email, then we'll send you resources. If you don't send us anything, then that's also fine. Uh, then we just hope that you um, enjoyed the webinar. Um, I guess that's it. Many thanks all of you for joining us and a huge big, big, big thank you to Andy and Helen for uh, presenting at this webinar and giving us their time so early in the morning in the UK to, um, to, to give us this information. Um, yeah, from here, from, from Purpose at Work, we, we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. And um, we hope to see you at uh, one of our other events or, um, or um, in, in our future webinars. Thank you all. Uh, take care and be well. Thank you.